Greetings, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. History of Tea, Part 12. Thanks to everyone who gave this show a chance and are still suffering through your humble narrator's presentation. Last time I told you one of the stories about how the Chinese tea makers in the Wuyi Mountains of Fujian turned lemons into lemonade with the invention of a black tea that the Europeans went crazy for. These became the famous black teas of their day, Bohi, Chiman, and Congo. The green tea of this age was known as Heisen tea. Along with Songlo, Bohi, and Kongu, Heisen made up the four big teas of 18th and 19th century global export tea trade. All the China tea clipper ships, all the smugglers of tea, overwhelmingly, most of the tea leaving China and heading to Europe was almost always one of these four kinds, or a combination of them. There were also others, but these were the main ones you always read about in the history books and saw their names mentioned in some of the literature from the 18th and 19th century. But it's in the 1600s where all the action begins to happen in Europe. 1610, as I said, the first tea reached the Netherlands, showing up in The Hague. It took a while to spread the word far and wide enough. The German people didn't get to sip their first tea till 1650. Eight years later, in 1658, on the streets of London, at Garraway's Coffee Shop and Exchange Alley in the heart of the city, tea had its debut. The earliest tea advert also came out in that year in the Mercurius Politicus and proclaimed, quote, That excellent and by all physicians approved drink called Chinian's Cha, by other nations Tay, alias Tea, is sold at the Sultanus Head a coffee house in Sweeting's Rents by the Royal Exchange, London. End quote. These English coffee houses that were popping up everywhere like Starbucks in our day served all three temperance beverages. Euchers had a nice quote from 1659 that said, There was also at this time a Turkish drink to be sold, almost in every street, called coffee, and another drink called tea, and also a drink called chocolate, which was a very hearty drink. End quote. Later on in 1675, Charles II is going to close all these places down, as they were highly and often correctly suspected of being places where men congregated to plot sedition and various manners of conspiracies. As a result of this, most of these coffee houses would start shutting down, and that's when these private clubs began popping up that quickly filled the vacuum. 1658, the year Oliver Cromwell died... That's when the stormy romance began that would last a lifetime. 1660, Charles II returned from exile. 1662, he married the Portuguese Catherine of Braganza. And it is she who we must bow in reverence to as Europe's first true great tea patron. When she took up with King Charles II in London, she brought with her the Portuguese custom of taking tea in the afternoon. As was always the case, no matter the Tang Dynasty or the House of Stuart, popular fashions and new things always started at the tip-top and worked their way down through society. So we thank Catherine of Braganza as the one to introduce this new beverage to the upper crust of British society. The British had to go get it from the Dutch at first. It wasn't going to be so easy for the British to just walk into China and take over. They purchased the tea from the Dutch in India, and then the tea was consolidated on board a cargo vessel that headed back to England. People in the Dutch colonies in the New World by 1670 were already sipping tea, supplied by the mother country. By 1674, though, New Amsterdam became a British colony, and it was renamed New York. And it was from that place, with all that early Dutch influence, that tea began to spread throughout the colonies. 1682, William Penn brought tea to Philadelphia. The colonists and loyal British subjects became the next market of people to notice tea. And these future Yanks would embrace it with equal enthusiasm as their British colonial masters. In 1684, with China's permission, of course, the British were able to get around the Dutch and send their first vessels directly to the port of Canton. Guangzhou. Here lie the humble beginnings of a British trading empire that would shake China to its foundations. 
These trading companies were after the big three commodities, of course. Always these three. Tea, silk, porcelain. At the genesis of this trade, the amount of tea being imported, first measured in the hundreds of pounds or kilos, once the 18th century kicks into high gear, British vessels will be hauling millions of pounds of this stuff back to Blighty. And it was the Honorable East India Company who held the monopoly for 150 years for all Far East trade with Britain. They managed the tea business. As the 18th century dawned, two markets for China's tea stood head and shoulders above the rest. One was Britain, and the other was Russia. Yeah, 1638, or maybe it might have been 1636, Tsar Michael I, founder of the Romanov dynasty, he was given a gift of 150 pounds of tea from a Mongolian ally. It started that way, a royal gift, some tribute, and this initial supply. Somehow, I guess the upper classes took note of it, because something like 40 years later, a treaty was signed that worked out a long-term trade deal between China, still in the Ming Dynasty, who at this time were on their last legs, and the House of Romanov, or whoever their representatives were. The way they carried out this tea trade between China and Russia was via camel caravan. No kidding. And just as you had with the tea horse routes, the Cha Ma Gu Dao, that went from Yunnan and Sichuan to Tibet and Qinghai, in Russia, they had what was known as the Tea Road. Its history began in 1689 as a direct result of the Treaty of Nerchinsk. And they called it the Tea Road because... Well, a lot of tea made its way to Russia along this caravan route. It was called the Siberian Route, and it stretched from Kalgan in northern Hebei, that is today the city of Zhangjiakou, and that was the loading and unloading point in the east. And men and their camels trekked along this caravan route all the way to Moscow. It cut straight through Mongolia, right into Mother Russia, and then it was a long haul west before these traders were having borscht again. It all began around 1735, during the reign of Empress Elizabeth of Russia, daughter of Peter the Great and Catherine I. Russia and China traded more than just tea. They were, of course, the usual suspects, porcelain and silk. In return for all this stuff, the Chinese got furs, textiles, hides, hardware, and cattle. It was a good, honest business, And because of the logistics and transport costs, tea wasn't cheap enough yet for the Russian masses to enjoy. They still had a way to go yet. By 1796, when Catherine the Great left this world, over three million pounds of tea was making its way west along the tea horse road to Moscow every year. They had added up to over 6,000 camel loads. Russian importers brought in loose tea, but mostly the Russian market still called for tea to be made into bricks, or at least up until the 1770s. I think I mentioned in an earlier episode the Russians didn't give up their tea bricks too easy. An additional advantage of tea bricks was that in Russia, along the route, in a pinch because of its intrinsic value, it could always be used as a coin of the realm. In fact, some of these tea bricks would be molded in such a way that you could cleanly break off portions of the brick to pay for something that costs less than a full tea brick. Sort of like a Hershey bar or a Real de Ocho, the pieces of eight from the Spanish dollar. By the end of the 18th and into the 19th century, tea quietly permeated every village in Russia. By the late 1770s, the samovar, took Russia by storm, and that iconic device became the shining sun from which all aspects of Russian tea culture revolved around. In 1861, there was a factory specifically built in Hanko that manufactured tea bricks destined for Russia. Isn't that funny how wherever tea went, China, even different regions of China, And then to Korea, Japan, Tibet, Central Asia, the Near East, Russia, and now Europe and the Americas. Wherever tea went, it universally took these places by storm. You'll see in Russia, as it was everywhere else where tea came a-calling, 
all the people from around the world would welcome tea into their culture and then put their own cultural nuances into the pleasures of drinking tea. Unique tea cultures exist in almost every country. I said at the outset we wouldn't wade too far into tea cultures that were outside of China, so I don't want to get pulled in by the strong gravity of Russia's rich tea culture. If you're new to tea and want to see what it's all about, the internet abounds with videos showing how the Russians do it, and man, they know how to enjoy tea. Many other tea cultures use samovars as well, in Turkey, Iran, in Kashmir, and other places in the Middle East and Central Asia. In 1880 came the Trans-Siberian Railway, so you can imagine what that did for the camel caravan business. The caravans and that whole world began to fade until it just disappeared altogether. They grow tea now in Russia. I did not know that. Right where they had the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, this tea from southernmost Russia is called the northernmost grown tea in the world. Someone up there in 1901 developed a cultivar or tea hybrid that could withstand the weather in that balmiest part of Russia. The tea from Sochi mostly supplies the domestic market. There's also a tea grown in China near Laoshan in Shandong province. That's got to be the northernmost place that grows tea. But at 36.1 degrees north to Sochi's 43.6 degrees north, the Russian tea is still king of the northernmost teas. Tea did not stop evolving in the Ming Dynasty. The march continued on during the Qing as well. Like the tea-loving Song Huizong Emperor, both the Kangxi and especially the Qianlong Emperor were great lovers and patrons of tea culture. Qianlong would hold these very elaborate tea parties right in the Forbidden City, inside the Chonghua Palace where he grew up. During the Qing, the number of places in China producing tea continued to grow. By the time of the Qing, all six categories of tea will be in existence. White, green, yellow, red, oolong, and pu'er. The number of tea houses, already quite plentiful in China, during the Qing grew even larger. And the local tea house had become a sort of de facto meeting place for friends and business people to meet and talk over tea. During the Qing, tea house entertainment also took off. Plays and Chinese opera became commonplace in these Qing-era tea houses. The dynasty also saw the number of new tribute teas increased more than ever before. If you go to Hangzhou and take the drive just outside of town to visit where they grow Longjing green tea, you'll see there at Hugong Temple a separate area fenced off where there are 18 tea trees. According to the story, the Qianlong Emperor himself visited this place four times to Mount Shifeng. So enamored was Qianlong with the dragon well tea there, the Longjing Cha, that he gave imperial honors to these 18 tea trees. The tea-loving Qianlong Emperor once wrote, quote, You can taste and feel, but not describe, the exquisite state of repose produced by tea, that precious drink which drives away the five sorrows. End quote. Well, that was easy for the Qianlong Emperor to say. He drank nothing but the best of the best. Traditional Chinese tea houses had been around in one form or another for eh, who knows how long, but they really expanded in numbers during the Northern Song, thanks to the combination of all this emerging tea culture, Emperor Huizong's sponsorship, and the general economic prosperity and good times. Well, until the Jurchens came, of course. The whole idea of a nice, cozy place to go drink tea, hang out, be entertained, was wildly popular and kept growing, evolving, and improving, especially during the Southern Song, when the capital was moved south of the Yangtze to Hangzhou. During the Ming, tea houses sprouted up all over as the common folk also wanted to partake in this pastime. China's a big country, so it took time for the pleasures of tea house culture to make its way down to all the cities and towns north and south of the Yangtze. But in the Qing dynasty, the tea house industry was bigger than ever before in China's history. 
a lot of the old ways of drinking tea gave way in the Qing to new innovative ways of enjoying tea culture. The first hundred years of the dynasty was a period of great wealth and prosperity, and it reflected in the kind of teaware that was being produced. The kilns of Jingdezhen ran hot for the entirety of the dynasty. One work of art coming out of that place was more spectacular than the next as far as those porcelain pieces destined for the Qing palace. Blue and white remain the most popular, but in the Qing, porcelain teapots were produced in more colors and in all kinds of cutting-edge shapes compared to the subtle elegance of the Song. Some of the stuff coming out of Jingdezhen, especially in the late Qing, would have looked right at home in a French Rococo painting. Many of these tea sets were never meant to be used and were only for display. So brisk was the business at Jingdezhen during the Qing, the number of kilns increased from 20 to 58. The gaiwan, or covered tea bowl that I mentioned in a previous episode, became one of the fruits of Qing dynasty tea culture. Though it was a Ming dynasty innovation, it was during the reign of Kangxi that it became so pervasive and widespread. Tea continued to be used for all kinds of court rituals and ceremonies, and all the way up and down the social ladder, tea houses, both shabby and chic, became places to meet, entertain, see friends, hold business meetings, plot revolution, or hang out and compose poetry. It was during the Qing dynasty that Fujianese tea masters first brought cuttings to Taiwan and attempted to start growing and processing tea there. Today and throughout the 20th century, oolong tea from Taiwan has been ranked among the finest in the world. They have Mr. John Da to partially thank for that. The company he established in 1864, Dodd and Company, pioneered the export of Taiwanese tea to world markets. Dodd used to work for Dent and Company until they went bust. He ended up in Taiwan on some job and hooked up with a Fujianese from Xiamen named Li Chunsheng. Together, these two became known as the fathers of Taiwan's tea industry. Tea grew indigenously on Taiwan, but it wasn't anything good. Tea seeds had been brought from Wu Yishan to Taiwan in 1855 and were planted in Dongding, in the lush northern mountains of Lugu in Nanto County. They grew the tea there, but the critical processing and finishing off was still handled across the strait in Fujian. Jardine Matheson, the noble house, began their involvement in the Taiwan tea trade in 1858. Before long, many of these Taiwanese growers were able to compete head-to-head with their cousins on the other side of the strait. By 1869, Dodd and company was shipping Formosa oolong tea to the USA, only four years out of our bloody civil war, or war for southern independence, as it's also known. It was a big hit in the U.S., and soon Dodd was shipping his Formosa oolong to Europe as well. Well, you know how it is. One guy sees all the profits being made in a certain business, and before long, everybody and their grandmother wants a piece of it. And seeing all the profits being made, others jumped into the fray. Some failed, and some made a success of it. Some went on to build up the entire industry. Well, next episode, we're going to shift the focus of our story of tea more to England and how Starting in the 1720s, the demand really started to grow. Though still small compared to its peak in 1860, English ships were transporting a quarter million pounds of tea a year to English ports. Queen Anne, Queen of England and of Scotland, 1702 to 1707, and then after the Acts of Union from 1707 until she died in 1714, well, she was Queen of Great Britain. She was the niece of Charles II and the sister of Mary II, wife of William III. Now, Queen Anne is going to play her part in furthering English tea culture. She was the first in England to use a silver tea service in the royal household. English coffee house culture during Queen Anne and her cousin George I's time would really take off. These coffee houses were very much a temperance alternative to the local pub. This English coffee house culture would evolve over the entire 18th century, 
One of my all-time favorites, Dr. Johnson, he was the greatest of the greats who would inhabit these establishments where all manner of good cheer and good conversation took place. Samuel Johnson, 1709 to 1784, was by his own accounts a hardened and shameless tea drinker. Let's close out this episode with some words from the good doctor who gave us so many great aphorisms and worthy quotations. In Johnson's day, tea was still a modern luxury. Tea was in demand by the lower classes, but it was out of their reach price-wise. In addition to being a shameless tea drinker, Johnson claimed that for 20 years he had, quote, diluted his meals with only the infusion of this fascinating plant, whose kettle has scarcely time to cool, who with tea amuses the evening, with tea solaces the midnight, and with tea welcomes the morning, end quote. When tea drinking began to take root in Great Britain, it was green tea that people initially drank. However, by 1760, more than half of all tea imported into Britain was black tea. Dr. Johnson said of the history of tea in Europe, quote, Tea was first imported from Holland by the Earls of Arlington and Ossory in 1666. From their ladies, the women of quality learned its use. Its price was then three pounds a pound, and continued the same to 1707. In 1715, we began to use green tea, and the practice of drinking it descended to the lower classes of the people. In 1720, the French began to send it hither by a clandestine commerce. From 1717 to 1726, we imported annually 700,000 pounds. From 1732 to 1742, a million and two hundred thousand pounds were every year brought to London, in some years afterwards, three millions, and in 1755, nearly four millions of pounds, or two thousand tons, in which we are not to reckon that which is surreptitiously introduced, which perhaps is nearly as much. Such quantities are indeed sufficient to alarm us. It is at least worth inquiry to know what are the qualities of such a plant and what are the consequences of such trade? End quote. Johnson also famously said, quote, Tea's proper use is to amuse the idle and relax the studious and dilute the full meals of those who cannot use exercise and will not use abstinence. End quote. The great, with a capital G, Dr. Samuel Johnson. And with that, we'll put the old proverbial bookmark in right here. Next episode, we'll pick up in the 18th century and look at what happens after prices and taxes come down in England and your average worker at mill or the shops or in the mines can finally afford tea. If you thought iPhones were hot, you haven't seen anything yet. So that's for next time. Until that time, this is your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, once again signing off from beautiful and lovely Southern Cali. Consider coming back next time, won't you, for another zestful episode of the Tea History Podcast.